want to shift gears a little teeny bit. We've been talking about pollution and, and managing uh, particles and things. Uh, a little bit of a, a detour. We're going to talk touch on um, different communities in the coastal zone and the ocean over the course of the semester. And so uh, particularly ones that we're maybe not that familiar with. And so one that I really want to touch on um, that does pertain to some of our discussions about pollution, um, but before we get there, uh, is this notion of what is down deep. Let's talk a little bit about deep sea communities next. So here, I'll give you guys this figure, but let's start looking at this. So first, I want you guys to understand the proper terms for different regions of our ocean planet. This is a, this is a cartoon. So this, this is, is a squished from right to left. So this is an exaggerated just so we can make the points here. The first is what you and I are most typically familiar with um, are the edges of our continents, are the edges of the ocean land um, system that we have here on our planet. So you and I are most familiar with continental, the, the continental shelf. Most of the readings that you guys have had so far that we'll have for the rest of the semester deal with goings on in the continental shelf. Those are the areas that you and I have, have uh, most easy, easy access to. It's where a lot of our fisheries are. It's where a lot of our recreation takes place. Uh, it's where our, our, our ports and harbors are, etc. That's all on the coastal shelf. The coastal shelf is a relatively, um, well, it depends on where we're talking. Again, we live on a very geologically young coastline. We are pretty much an up-down coastline when it comes to cliffs and things like that, right? Again, we can go out to Point Magoo and we can pick, a, pick up a, a stone from the eroding cliff face there and throw it as far as we can and it plops into the, uh, into the ocean and sinks down. It's maybe in 100 feet of water, you know, say 30 meters of water. We did the same, if we did the same thing off of Florida, or North Carolina or something like that, throw that stone and you know the same distance plop and it lands in who knows four feet of water, something like that, right? So we have a very young coast, a very raw coast, a very comparatively speaking uneroded coast, so more up down. Other parts of the world are very old, very eroded, comparatively flat. But even with that, even though that, that, that some areas are wider than others, um, this story still holds, which is we have a, a continental shelf that hugs the, hugs the land area. Then we have this relatively steep and relatively, uh, uh, horizontally speaking, relatively narrow continental slope. So this is, this is the mountainside where we're dropping off into the deep ocean. we hit the abyssal plain, we hit the bottom of the ocean. Right before we hit the abyssal plain, we have a little toe. Just like if we have, let's say, an eroding cliff, si eroding um, side of one of our hills here, and all those little rock pebbles fall down to the bottom and then they accumulate at the bottom, that's what the continental rise is. The continental rise is, is the, the little toe of, of stuff that has fallen down the continental slope and built up. So going from the top again, we have the continental shelf, the continental slope, the continental rise, and then the abyssal plain. So the abyssal plain is the default condition. The abyssal plain is this more or less even, more or less, more or less flat plain that's going all around the planet, the deep bottom of the ocean. This is etched here and there by some essentially rents in the ocean. And those are called trenches, and those go very deep. So the deepest one of those is the Marianas Trench, and the deepest part of the Marianas Trench is called the Challenger Deep. That's the deepest location in the world. We've only had uh, a three humans have only ever been that deep. A couple crazy folks more than 50 years ago in an experimental uh, bathys in an experimental submarine thing 
that went down and looked and showed they could do it and came back and surprisingly lived, even though some <laughs> bolts broke and things like that in, in their uh, container. And then just most recently, about a year and a half ago, James Cameron built his own super cool robot thing and went down. Um, we've had no electronic probes make it down that deep. The Japanese almost did. A couple years ago, they had this probe that almost got to the bottom. It was maybe like, I forget, it was either 100 feet or 100 meters, and then, it, pfft, and then one of the wires shorted, and it meh, didn't make it. But, but going down to the bottom of the bottommost part of the ocean is a huge, huge, huge technological challenge, akin to going to the moon, almost. Um, I mean, it is very, very difficult, incredible pressures down there. Okay, the other thing that's going to break up the abyssal plain are these, so that, that, was, that was stuff that, that takes the benthos down deep. Another thing that happened to bring the benthos up, the first of which would be a, a volcanic island. Classic examples would be the Hawaiian island chain, where we have um, what's generally described as a hot spot or a relative thinning of the uh, tectonic plates of, the, of the, the crust of the earth and lava is able to bloop, 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 squeeze through that toothpaste tube, if you will, of a hole and it, and it brings molten rock and that rock builds up upon itself and creates an, an island and lifts the bottom off of the otherwise abyssal plain. The other thing we can get, uh, basically same sort of idea, um, would be uh, the building up of of uh, sediment, uh, or excuse me, the build of benthos. In this case, typically because uh, plates are coming together, things are mushing up together, boom, 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 and they're shoving up, and so they're, we're also, in effect, adding, uh, adding rock and growing higher, but in this case, because of stuff, stuff is being pushed, pushed together. Um, in theory, you can get a trench when plates come together and one goes beneath another and they, and they essentially fold down into the and creates a crack. The submarine ridge happens when they push together and they push and they just happen to push up. Um, we can also get ridges from um, hydrothermal vents and stuff at times, but that's another, that's another thing. Okay, make sense? And so these depths here are all, you know, generic key, right? So there's, there's nothing super magical about 200 meters or whatever, but this, it's just the typical, typical depth at which we, we tend to see these things. Sound good? The, the key provinces I'd like you guys to know about are these ones that we just measured, we just mentioned. So again, we have the continents that you and I typically experience. Then we have the continental shelf. Much of the continental shelf was either exposed or potentially was exposed historically due to shifting sea level, um, uh, uh, sea level changes. Then again, we hit that, that slope area that's relatively steep. So I have here the average, the average uh, angle is four degrees, which might not seem like a lot, but it, it's, it is. <laughs> I'll just say that it is. Um, I don't remember where I got these numbers. I, I, didn't, I personally didn't go out and measure all the slopes of the, uh, of the ocean, but that's, that's, yeah, we'll just use that as a, as a ballpark. Then again, we have these, these accumulations, these toes at the bottom of these hills, if you will, called the rises. Then we have the abyssal plain, the default condition for the oceans, the, the default bottom condition for the ocean is to be overlying an abyssal plain. Uh, we have these ridges and we have these trenches. I left off here islands, but make sense? Great. Okay, two, uh, again, I'll, I'll be giving you guys these, these diagrams since, uh, since they are a little bit, uh, a little bit much. Um, so the first one is let's talk about how we name ocean regions based on physical location. Okay, so this is not life. This is, this is geomorphology. This is morphology. First, you'll notice where you and I are, or not where you and I are right now, but if, we want, if you and I went to the beach right now, we would be in what we might call the supra-tidal, or the supra-littoral. 
And so that's above. So that's the above the tidal area. This would be the area that just barely gets washed every now and then, maybe by winter storms or the highest high tide spray, you know, that kind of stuff. So supra above, more than above the tides. Again, I'm going to give you some other terms in a little bit, but this is, this is the stuff for, um, for place-based, for location-based um, areas. Okay, so we have the, uh, the littoral system. The littoral system means uh, of or relating to the coast. So Dr. Patch discussed littoral cells. Those are the, the way, in her case, the way sand moves in and around the coastline. Um, my Gmail is littoral pirate because I mostly am in the littoral zone, right? That's a very nerdy joke. Um, okay, so littoral system next to the coast. Supratidal is the stuff that's high. Then we get into the intertidal, the area that is typically between the highest high tide and the lowest low tide of the year. Then we get into the subtidal, the areas that are always, or almost always, maybe not during a tsunami, but, but basically during normal conditions, always submerged. 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. Then we get to the stuff that's, that is um, um, deeper, typically deeper than that continental shelf that we mentioned. So that would be um, uh, the, the, uh, where people originally took bath, bathymetric readings, and so that's where we get that term. After we leave the... Um, uh, typical slope area, we get into the deep sea. The deep sea we call the abyssal, the abyssal zone, or the abyss. And that's most of the deep sea. And then we have some of these places, like these trenches we just mentioned, that are even deeper than the typical bottom of the ocean, and these are hadal systems. So this is, this is Hades. This, is, this comes from the term hell, right? So that's based on depth. Again, areas at or near the coast are going to be littoral systems. And then stuff that's farther away, we would typically, uh, at least at the bottom, we'd call that a deep sea system. All of the stuff that I'm talking about right now, all of these terms apply to the bottom of the ocean. The bottom of the ocean we refer to as the benthic or the benthos. period, new paragraph. We can also talk about the parts of the ocean that are um, away from the coast. So if we start that conversation, the stuff that's near to, the, to a landform, we would call a neuritic system. Or if it's far away from any hard surface, from any island, from any continent, we would call that an oceanic system, also called a pelagic system. So pelagic is water column. Benthic is at or associated with the bottom or, or, or a hard, hard, hard structure. So we have all these things that are related and you can sort of combine them in different ways. So we have uh, areas based on um, uh, depth into the ocean or terms based on depth into the ocean. We have terms based on if we're near, some, near a hard structure or far away from a hard structure. And, and then the last thing that we'll uh, talk about is uh, depth ranges based on the ability to do photosynthesis. So if we are in the area where light penetrates, where photons enter, we call that the photic zone. As we talked about before, not all, not, not, not all wavelengths equally penetrate. So the photic zone means at least some 
light is there. Typically after, as we talked about before, after a few tens of meters, most of the, the diverse colors you and I are used to experiencing, the reds, the oranges are gone, and we're left with mostly blue light. And so uh, that's the photic zone. Once we go below the photic zone, it's never, ever light. The only light that ever enters into the photic zone is chemically produced light, bioluminescence, that kind of stuff. So the photic zone is the, is the part where under the, depending on where we are on the globe, the summertime of the, the, uh, the time of the year where the sun's straight overhead in, in noon, at noon, there's at least a few photons making it down. Once we go below that depth, we lose, um, we get into the aphotic or the non-lighted realms. Cool? Questions about that? All right. So here's, here's a cartoon that, that's not, that, that, I mean, it's not the best cartoon, but, but I like it, um, it, not for any definitions, but just to sort of give you a, a nice sense of the, the complexity of this stuff, right? So we tend to, tend to show you this in this, in this uh, you know, cross section. But again, realize we are talking about a real world place, a three dimensional place that has all this wonderful, cool structure. And there's little, little erosion things and little ridges things and, and all, of these, all of this stuff. And so it's really this wonderfully complex, neat three dimensional thing, even though in these cartoons, we typically talk about it in two dimensions. And I think this picture in particular really well illustrates this is, this is back east, but really well illustrates a notion of the, the continental shelf versus the abyssal area. And so I think you can more easily see here that it really, um, you can more see how the shelf at least was or potentially was exposed to the air at some point. And maybe right now it's underwater, but it shares much more commonality with where you and I live than with the deep ocean, geologically speaking. Uh, uh, morphologically speaking, that stuff. Okay, almost done with almost done with learning definitions. Okay, so the last thing I want to mention is this is the same graph I just showed you, but last time I showed you um, uh, location, you, you know, geog geographic regions. Now I want to give you some uh, terms for critters, for organisms, for the biological resources that are so important in our discussions of the management of the ocean. And so these are terms for critters that move or, that, that live in and around the ocean. Okay, so, so the first is we have, again, at the bottom, just like with the, the other term, we have the benthic or the benthos. So a critter that lives attached or, uh, or, or right next to or swimming just above the bottom and is almost always there, we would refer to that critter as a benthic organism. Or if we're talking about the group of critters there, we might talk about them being the benthos. Next, let's go way to the super, super top of the ocean. Stuff that live at the air, water, surface, or very close to that. Those things are known as nuston. Okay, then a term that you probably have heard, plankton. So plankton is an organism that lives in the water column. So not at the bottom, not at the, not at the, the, the top skin, but somewhere in between the nuston and the benthos uh, communities. Plankton, despite what um, you might have heard in your high school biology class or whatever, um, they can move, they can swim, they can say where they would like to go, but their amount of control is dwarfed by the currents. So while they can, over time, you know, by, 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 by swimming, let's say, upwards, tend to get into the currents that tend to move, let's say, south, so maybe over time they can sort of influence where they go, but on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, they're moving where the large mass of water is taking them. Those are plankton. We most typically talk about phytoplankton, plankton that photosynthesize, or zooplankton, phytoplankton that eat other, that get their energy from things other than the sun. So we have plankton, and then the other stuff would be nekton. Nekton is everything that is um, 
and generally speaking, we think of plankton as small things. Sing, it doesn't have to be, but typically single-celled little, little critters. Nekton is generally speaking large critters. Whales, fish, dolphins, that kind of stuff. So Nekton, while they can be influenced by tides and currents and stuff like that, if they don't want to be influenced by that, they can swim however they want. And they have the ability to move beyond the constraints of what the, the, the current is, uh, is exhibiting upon their bodies. Okay? So there we go. So we have some, some location-based terms, and then we have some terms for the types of critters uh, based on where they, they live and, and do their stuff. Cool? Questions about that? All right, again, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, make some PDFs of these guys and give them to you. Okay, um, now, uh, important to talk about the types of, uh, of energy sources that, that folks use to make a living here in these different realms of the ocean. So again, basically, we, we can talk about um, two flavors. Uh, so we're sort of slicing things up in the ocean in different, different organizational categories. Here's another way to slice them up based on productivity. Autotrophs and heterotrophs. Whoa, it's misspelled. Heterotrophs. That is lame. It's hetero. There's better. Heterotrophs. Um, so uh, the autotrophs are going to make their own food. We typically think on land of photoautotrophs, of things that are getting their energy from the sun. And we absolutely have those guys uh, in the ocean as well. But we also, uh, as we've discovered over the last 30 years, we also have an amazingly large number of, uh, surprisingly large number of um, food webs that are built around um, critters that uh, are getting their energy from chemical energy, from chemical bonds, things like uh, sulfides and things. And so, uh, so whether, whether we're talking about their energy coming from light or chemical energy, we're, we're essentially taking carbon dioxide and water and creating sugars out of that. And that those sugars are then in terms translocated around the organism's body or, or consumed by other critters. And, those, and these bonds are broken. That's where we get our, our energy. Uh, obviously, the autotrophs are the basis of all of our food webs and all that kind of good stuff. Um, but what we see is unlike in, on land, on land, most of the photosynthesis comes from macroscopic critters, angiosperms in particular. So our grasses, our trees, our shrubs. Most of the productivity in the ocean is done by phytoplankton. Most of the productivity in the ocean is done by these, these uh, single-celled critters. So uh, it's a very different uh, system. Uh, and this productivity, in turn, leads to key segregation of, uh, of the goings-on in the ocean. So productivity, because so much of it is dictated by the light, even though we do have these chemical sources of energy, light, the, um, energy from the sun still dominates and is the most important energy source. Because that light attenuates dramatically as we go down into the oceanic depths, we have a real dichotomy in terms of the productivity, much more so than just looking at over our terrestrial landscapes. Yes, we have some areas that are mountaintops, some areas that are deserts, but generally speaking, there's, there's a lot of productivity over a lot of the surface of the earth. Here, um, we're not talking about a, primarily a two-dimensional life space. We're talking about a three-dimensional life space, and most of that productivity is in the roof, is at the top of that area. So we, then, we can talk about the so-called critical depth. The critical depth is where the uh, organisms, uh, uh, the, the physiology that's happening inside a particular organism, organism be it a phytoplankton, uh, you know, single cell guy or whatever, um, is going to equal, the respiration is going to equal the energy fixation or the productivity. So where we come into equivalence is the critical depth, and that typically occurs at about a light level that's 1% the light level at the, at the, uh, in the air, at the surface of the water. 
and that uh, is the, yeah, so there we go, the, the, the critical depth. So much more productivity, many more critters, many more, much more biomass, et cetera, up here compared to the stuff down below. That's one thing. Two, as we talked about before, we can look at, uh, so this case, this is surface productivity. This is chlorophyll A, which is uh, one of our, obviously, photosynthetic pigments. And we can sense this now with satellites. Again, this is only the surface. This is not deep, because our satellites can only penetrate the top few centimeters or so of the water. But, um, but there we go. So, so what do you guys see about this pattern? Where is, so what do you, where is productivity the highest? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's a regular map, heat map. So, so the hotter the colors, the larger the value, the, the greater the productivity per unit area, or you can think of it as the greater the chlorophyll per unit area. And then the cooler the colors, the lower the value. Right. So those coastal shelves we mentioned, right? Those shallow areas where you and I live, where you and I typically fish, those areas are the most productive. Uh, and, and, right, so there we go. So areas that we have a lot of sources of, say, terrestrial-derived sediments, terrestrial-derived um, uh, 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 nutrients and things like that, are there's a lot of a lot of photosynthetic activity going on there uh, also in areas that concentrate uh, some of those nutrients etc so here we can see we can see some of our global circulation patterns if you recall here here the the, the general pattern is water is surface water is coming up from here going down this away right and you can see I here pulling this productivity, if you will, down along the California coast. Similarly here in South America, boom, pulling it up here, running right towards the uh, uh, equator, kind of same thing here, right here, right? And that same circulation, pull up here, here it's pulling it down, and so it's pulling it this way. Cool. Uh, right there. Look, I just said that. Coastal waters and upwelling zones with higher nutrient concentrations, blah, blah, blah. So Aspen. When you're looking at this as far as coral reefs, yeah. where do they fit in? Ooh, okay. So, so Aspen's question is, how does this work with coral reefs? Because coral reefs are typically in the tropical areas. Okay. So coral, so th now this data, again, this is surface water chlorophyll A. So this is, this is just, again, the stuff we're measuring in the top, call it half meter of the water column. And so, so we don't have coral. We, we, we actually do have deep coral. But the kind of coral that Aspen's asking about are what you guys are probably thinking about, which are coral that have a lot of zooxanthellae, a lot of commensal, commensal uh, uh, plankton inside of them, basically, zooxanthellae inside of them. Those guys can't live here for a couple of reasons. One, sometimes of the year, this area doesn't get much sunlight. So if you have, if you have a, a critter that's demanding a lot of photosynthesis, you're going to be starving for a lot of the year, not do too well, one. Two, we have all this stuff going on up here that's going to tend to produce more biomass in the water. That's going to tend to produce more scattering of light. So that's going to tend to have areas where the light doesn't penetrate uh, as readily, at least during some times of the year. So we tend to have the coral reefs down in the, here's, here's Hawaii, for example, around Hawaii, let's say, where one, we don't have a lot of upwelling and a lot of massive productivity that would in effect act to cloud the water. And in other words, limit the light penetration. And then two, they tend to be, and because they are photosynthetic, so, so not a lot of cl uh, cloudy uh, water, but then two, a lot of year round, strong, bright light. Yes. So the question is, so, okay, so again, this, this, is, this, is sur this is surface water column productivity we're talking about here. So the question is, so how, do, how, do, how, does coral reef, how do coral reefs compare with the average water column? And the typical, I don't really like it, but the, but the typical um, uh, illustration that people use is um, an oasis in the desert, 
right? So uh, relatively speaking, per unit volume, low productivity, then you hit the coral reef, very high productivity. So different from the surrounding. And it's more concentrated. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say that that's, that people typically deal with that in a very simplistic way. And so, so uh, but, th but that, that, that's the most common answer people would give you, I think. Um, yeah. Also realize that this is integrating over, over, you know, hundreds, thousands of miles, right? And it's all, you know, more or less the same color, right? More or less a lot of, you know, intermediate productivity. Check out these, some of these rivers off of Russia. Really, really high because we have these seasonal flushes and, and everything grows like crazy during some times of the year. Other times this is frozen under ice. That's another story. Um, uh, here, when we do have these productivity events around islands, they're very, very concentrated. They're very, very small. I mean, if you look, if you look at this scale, even the zoomed out at this, at this resolution, we see these little bloop, 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 bloop. Okay, so those are some of the northwest um, Hawaiian islands. And those are essentially, we're seeing cor uh, what effect uh, amount to coral reef, coral reef productivity associated with these little blips. So we do, we can, we do have that, but it's not, you know, it's not on our map here. It's not an inch by an inch of that productivity. It's very, very localized. That's not to say it's not important, but, but in this grand sort of averaging out of productivity, it's, it's different. Other questions about that? Again, this is just surface water, just chlorophyll A being used as a proxy for productivity. Okay. Um, oh, look, another map. Look, I just thought this was so important. I gave you guys a couple of maps. Look at that. So uh, again, relatively uh, low uh, productivity surface waters we're talking about. So here's some numbers for, for Aspen. So this is in the um, uh, shallow water. Uh, so this is in the, in the, the peach or pink areas, uh, something like 75 grams of carbon fixed per square meter per year. This would be square meter of the surface uh, water of sur uh, the surface um, spanning something that would be uh, really high next to some of these coastal upwelling areas like we have off our coast like we have off the uh, South American coasts is something on the order of at least another order of magnitude greater uh, than that um, still again uh, measured per uh, per surface area of the ocean and there are problems with that we should probably be measuring that per cubic um, cubic volume, but anyway. Cool? Productivity, as we said, segregates uh, some of our, our areas in the ocean, and, and most obvious, the areas where we can have a net positive photosynthetic balance versus areas below that region. And for a long time, we thought that was the whole story. Then in the, in the 1970s, and I have a sweet video I'll... Um, I don't think I have it with me, but I'll, I'll show you guys next time. Um, uh, when we first discover these things, that at the time, the theory was that only uh, the sun could provide enough uh, energy to, to have you know, diverse life forms and stuff like that. So this was a huge discovery that, in, in a sense, sources of uh, chemical energy rent from the bottom of the ocean and exposed to the, the rest of the ocean through cracks in the ocean floor could set up these quite diverse, quite abundant ecosystems. And so um, if you're not used to this nomenclature, that one in a degree, that stands for, that's primary. Right, so that's how when we, when we talk about food webs, a lot of times you'll see people write that way. Or secondary would be the number two in a degree sign. So primary production here is done by an extremophile that can take uh, potentially very high temperatures, um, you know, boiling, uh, uh, you know, close to boiling temperatures, or sometimes even more than that. Uh, since then, we've discovered a lot of these crazy critters in, um, in, in, in uh, microbial communities in places like thermal hot springs in Yellowstone and elsewhere. But uh, they don't match the communities in the ocean in terms of the, the macroscopic organisms that in turn feed upon these microbial systems.
we have some areas that, that tend to be relatively rich in these hydrothermal vent communities. And those are shown here on the, the uh, around our continent on the uh, left hand side. And if you note, they're often by these tech areas of high tectonic activity, where again, the, the typical abyssal plane, the crust of the earth is, is weakened in some way, shape or form and can allow um, heated materials from down in the core, closer to the core of the earth to be exposed to the water, etc. Um, they look like this. Uh, they, they look, um, I mean, in a gross sense, they look sort of like what the deep water horizon looked like, right? In terms of this opaque material bubbling into the um, water columns and they go for a long time. They can go for uh, a few weeks or a year, or they can go for decades um, in, in any one particular spot. Um, they lead to critters that um, are really, really neat. We have whole entire food chains that have, have built up around these systems. So here we have all of this uh, heated um, uh, sort of geochemical soup, if you will, bubbling up and it's spewing out. And amongst other things, there's a lot of sulfides in there. And we have these communities that have built, these bacterial communities that are built around either just inside, and we call these things the chimney, call the structure a chimney. And what's happening is there's this crud that's coming out akin to how a volcano forms, but some of this material will precipitate out and form a bit of a hard structure. And then more will go up more, and some will get, so over the course of many years, we can build up these structures called chimneys. Within the uh, internal tube, if you will, of that chimney, and then just on the outside, we have these, these microbial mats that will build up that are absorbed, through, through their cell walls, they're absorbing this um, chemical matrix, the sulfide typically matrix, take it inside, they break that H2S and they use that as the source for their sugar fixing. We have straight up just free floating, free living microbial critters. Then we have these hosts of, of um, microbes that are living inside the tissues of some macroscopic critters, just like these tube worms. So these tube worms, what we're seeing here, these are essentially breathing um, and, and energy collecting structures. So we have um, uh, uh, the water, the, the sulfide rich water is, ba is floating around here, bathing these critters that, that to, what is to you and I toxic, uh, goes through this, this permeable membrane inside and they are, uh, they have these microbial guys in here and they are, and, and or the action of the, the fixing of the sugars are happening in here. And so these guys are an essential, they're not filter feeding, but they're energy feeding, right? From these, these energy rich molecules that are floating around the water. And then we have things that feed on them. So then we have things like this little crab right here who's going to go around and he's going to feed directly on the mats. And then there's guys that feed on the crabs and et cetera, et cetera. So this whole food web builds up around these uh, hydrothermal communities. How deep are those? Uh, uh, thousands of meters. So are they in the abyssal? Yes. Well, they're in the abyssal plane, but a lot of times they're, they're, they're shallower than the abyssal plane okay. because they've, they've come up a bit. They're on, they're on uh, oceanic ridges and things. But yes they, yes, they absolutely can be in the abyssal plane, but typically they're, they're a little bit above that. Imagine a world of perpetual night, a world where life thrives without sunlight, a world hidden deep beneath the surface of the sea. 1977, the Galapagos Rift off the coast of South America. A chain of volcanoes along the sea floor intrigues geologists. A team sets off in a submarine to look for underwater hot springs called hydrothermal vents. 
They are completely unprepared for what they will see when they turn on the light. These are non-biologists. These are geologists. These creatures totally new to science. An entire ecosystem completely unknown before. Looking for vents, they have stumbled upon light. <laughs> Lots of it. Since 1977, dozens of vent sites around the world have been discovered and hundreds of new species. Huge red-tipped tube worms, white crabs, ghostly fish, plume worms, dandelion siphonophores, amphipods, squat lobsters, strange shrimp with eyes on their backs, even a new octopus. Hydrothermal vents are oases of life in the deep sea, yet they are some of the most extreme environments on Earth. Hydrothermal vents are created when cold water seeps through cracks in the ocean crust and hits hot magma. Superheated water then rises up and bursts through the ocean floor. The water at the vents is hot enough to melt lead. The vents spew toxic chemicals. How can life survive? Scientists were startled by the answer. The key is chemosynthesis, life that gets its energy from chemicals. These chemicals are released by the heat of the Earth's core. At the base of the vent food web are tiny single-celled bacteria and organisms called archaea. These organisms live by converting chemicals, such as hydrogen sulfide, into energy. These heat-loving microbes are thought to be the oldest forms of life on Earth. Chemosynthesis has completely changed the way we think about the origins of life on our planet. It may all have begun without sunlight, at a hydrothermal vent, at the bottom of the sea. Uh, yeah, we can't survive down there. So, so we typically don't go down there. The only humans that go down would go down a submarine. So yeah, so we would, yeah, we can't handle those pressures we would implode instantly um so uh yeah yeah um i mean in theory you could get in the sweet spot in theory if you were went, went down one of these things and had some pressurized suit but didn't have any temperature controls in theory you could move to a point you know it would vary depending on what site we were visiting but maybe 10 feet from the 10 feet from the the crack that maybe it would be roughly room temperature like it is right here in this room. And if you go another five feet that way, you'd boil. And if you go another five feet that way, you'd be like in a freezer, right? So, uh, so in theory, the temperature, you, you could pick the optimal temperature. And actually, you'll see these organisms will, will be, um, you know, only the microbial guys can be really in the full, fullest brunt. And even many of them can't be in the fullest full brunt of the temperature depending on what what uh fissure we're talking about and so you kind of come away and then it gets just enough that these guys can persist and then you and then but still a lot of the macroscopic guys can't live there and then you know a few more feet and then those the tube worms and and you know crabs can persist kind of thing do we know how fast that water that water is coming out as fast as it looked like. So it look it almost looks like it almost looks like we're looking at a um, let's say like a display tank in a lab and the, the shimmering of the water. That shimmering is from the heat waves. Just just like when we look across the desert in a hot in a hot d day and, it, and it's kind of squiggly lines. The, the the horizon looks squiggly. Same idea. So that's basically both heat, you know, refracting the the white light of the sub that's filming that. But it's also just the water itself is moving, so it, it's, it, it depends on how fast. But but I mean, you saw the plumes coming out, so it's coming out many meters per se, potentially many meters per second, kind of thing. Yeah, it's like it's a constant, right? It's boil, it's boiling water, it's pressurized down deep, and it it's squirting out essentially a fire hose 
Again, very similar to the Deepwater Horizon, you know, same basic phenomenon. We, in that case, we had pressurized oil coming out of a little uh, straw, and that's essentially what these things are. It's pressurized uh, boiled seawater that's, that's been cooked with the rock, surrounding rock to create this chemical soup, and it's squeezing out of a little teeny tiny hole. No, it's, l it's less dense because it's hotter. So it's generally speaking lighter. And so, uh, so it's, it's both the pressure that's squirting it up, but it's also the, less, the lower density that's helping move it up. Um, although although, although the, the, the pressure of the, if you imagine the, the squeezing of the toothpaste tube is the dominant force creating the, the uh, movement of the water at that point. And so once these kind of are created, do they just keep going and going and going, or do they, will they shut down like after a while? Right, so Sean's question is how, so we have these hydrothermal vents going on here. Do they, they start and they just go for a million years? No. So they have definite lifespans, and just like a volcano does. Um, so we do have things, for example, like we have, um, we have, uh, let's say, uh, Kilauea, like the, the big, the big the volcano on the big island of Hawaii, and that's, and it's, it's been going on as far as we can tell for a long time, millions of years, right? And so as the plates move, that, that thin spot in the crust, for whatever reason we don't fully understand, doesn't move, right? And so as the plates move, it looks as if we create this pearl necklace of islands, this chain of islands. Um, but if we, so if we picked one of those spots, say Oahu, it was a, it was a volcano for a long time, thousands of years, and then eventually, eventually it, it, uh, it moves such that we pinch off that tube and it starts a new tube and that begins to form a new island. Same thing happens with these things, although generally speaking, much faster. So again, these, these hydrothermal vent areas tend to be more on the order of decades or so, maybe hundreds of years, not, not millions of years kind of thing. Um, but, but since we only discovered them in the seven, late 70s, we, you know, we, volcanoes, we, can, we have a much, uh, and also these things never get to the surface, right? Whereas volcanoes get to the surface, so you and I can go on vacation to Hawaii and look at it and collect rocks. It, it, physically getting to these things is one, a, a difficult thing, very expensive endeavor. Two, we've only really known about them for a few decades, so we're still learning about their, their lifespan, but again, it, it is on the order, it, it's nowhere near on the millions of years kind of scale. Okay, let's talk about some of the factors that drive the goings on in some of these deep systems. As we've just been talking about, very high, pr the typical condition is very high pressure. Recall that we, we add one atmosphere worth of pressure for every 10 meters we go down into the ocean. And so, as we go, and as we said, these things tend to be, you know, a few thousand feet down. That's a lot of press. That's a lot of squeezing. A lot of pounds per square inch of of body of of your body of my body if we were down there. Also, excluding the actual immediate vicinity of the of the vent, recall the average temper the temperature of the ocean is cold. It's just above freezing, so four degrees Celsius. Um, again, we're deep, so there's no photosynthetic activity going on. Generally speaking, compared to our shallow water realms, uh, food tends to be scarce. Again, th this is this is the default. This is the default deep sea system. So I'm just talking about not not necessarily hydrothermal vents, just any deep sea system. And in general, we have a huge volume of water. Again, we're talking primarily in these systems about three-dimensional space. On land, yes, we have three-dimensional space that insects can move through, uh, that birds can move through, but primarily most of the things, the, the, the crawling insects, the vertebrates, most of the vertebrates, you and I, the plants, things are all attached. So of course we're three-dimensional, but what we're primarily fixed on a two-dimensional surface, whereas the default thing here is not two-dimensional, the default thing is a three-dimensional uh, space, a volume. And that means we have a huge volume of 
of living area that in turn translates into a relatively uh, uh, low probability of encountering other things, other things we want to eat, other things that want to eat us. So when we're looking for a significant other, it's hard to find a significant other, generally. When we are looking for something to eat, it's also kind of hard on average. Of course, there's exceptions, but generally kind of hard to find something to eat. Again, the majority of the bottom of the ocean is at abyssal plain, deeper than three kilometers. Most of the building blocks that we use in, in, our, in our bodies, in, our, in our, our daily living, is going to be imported from elsewhere, imported from the overlying waters. We didn't really understand this, but in the last few decades we've really come to and so people you said that that was the default thing the more we look at it the more we see there actually are these really intense pulses of material so yes there's this constant little drizzle 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 of stuff from the shallow waters to the lower realms but there's also these intense periods these could be brought about by say a hurricane these could be brought about by seasonal changes and so we have these pulses of organic matter that can um, lead to these pulses of, of importation of carbon and other things to the, 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 the deeper realms of the ocean. In general, when we talk about, like, like Aspen was asking earlier about coral reefs, in general, relatively low biomass per unit area say of you know, per square meter let's say of the bottom of the ocean compared to uh, per square meter of a coral reef or per square meter of a of a rainforest let's say but which is a bit a bit perplexing here uh, but very high biodiversity per unit area so high species richness if you will uh, I'll, I'll leave the, there's all kinds of theory about why, what may and may not be, and we could spend an entire class just talking about that theory. That's not the purpose of our class. We're, we're primarily focused on the management, but you should realize that that is, that is the case. Most of the critters that are on the benthos in the deep sea are detritivores. For example, we have a low biodiversity, but uh, excuse me, low low amount of biomass overall. If we added up all those critters, say on a per unit area basis of the benthos, we have a surprisingly high diversity of of vertebrate fish species. Why do you guys think? Well, what might be an an explanation for that? Niches. What's that? Niches. Right, and and so continue that idea on. Right. So they tend to be scavengers. So not just a, so so the, the the benthic things tend to be detritivores, but um, fish tend to be really good scavengers and predators. And so those guys um, seem to be able to uh, uh, so, so the things that are actively hunting uh, seem to be able to find some of this biomass. And so we have a diversity of things that that hunt and acquire um, material in different ways. Okay, that was, that, was the, that was the default system. That was the default deep sea system. Let's talk a little bit about these hydrothermal vent systems. Again, just like before, we have relatively high pressure. That's still true. The average temperature outside of these hydrothermal vents uh, tends to be, again, low. Again, it's deep. Again, no, no photosynthesis. Again, food resources on average tend to be relatively rare, relatively... Uh, low biomass and the same thing all of these things that we mentioned for the default say abyssal plain condition many of these are swapped around when we talk about these hydrothermal vent communities so as, as Asma was asked about the coral reefs earlier these things function kind of like coral reefs right and these sort of these these sort of hot spots for diversity these hot spots for biomass in what is otherwise a generally 
low, at least per unit volume, um, um, region of, of life. So we have these chemosynthetic bacteria that act like primary, well, they are primary, produ primary producers. They, they, they function just like, say, the zooxanthellae up in coral reefs. Uh, they're also, we all, the, the coldness is also counteracted by the hot mineral rich water. And while that's not in and of itself necessarily the only thing, it is important to note that that warmer water allows higher Q10s, right? Higher physiological processes and rates. So you can do things that would maybe be a bit more difficult uh, in, the, in the default cold water environment. And uh, so then we have this, so then location matters here. Right? So we have this place where things can come accumulate. And so that's good and bad. What were some of the good things of having stuff concentrate like that? What might, in terms of, you know, establishing an ecological community? One place with a lot of food in one area. Right. So we've got a lot of food. So now we, we don't have to be spending our time swimming all around, hunting, 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 hunting. We go to one place and we're guaranteed there's a lot of potential prey there. Right? So that's good. And the disadvantage of that would be? That's right. Everything knows that's there, right? So not only is there a lot of food for you to eat, there's a lot of things that are trying to eat you that might go there, right? So, so again, as with always in nature, there's these pluses and minuses and this sort of constant um, uh, uh, dynamic uh, evolution happening. So I like to call this the chemical gumbo. Because it really is, we, we, we tend to talk about the sulfides, but it really is this huge mix of compounds. And again, it's going to primarily be dictated by the, the surrounding rock and what's making up the, the minerals and, and such that are making up that, those rock structures. Um, but this is what it looks like, right? So we have some of these cracks in the seafloor allowing, as that animation showed, allowing seawater to come in. Um, it starts to boil and get really hot. And this is where we have that wa that that seawater and the salts of the seawater interacting with whatever the matrix is in that uh, lithosphere. Uh, and then it gets brought up, and we have this big smoker stuff, and then we have um, all the critters uh, associated with um, with that plume. We typically see, to get at Sean's question earlier about how long do these things live, we typically see um, a classic case of succession at these systems. Just like we see at, say, coral reef systems. Although coral reefs tend to be in place for a long, long time. And we, we don't typically see a new coral reef being born. Whereas we can frequently see, um, relatively frequently see, hydrothermal vents uh, erupting and beginning. So here's, a, here's a, a, a classic tale of succession of these biological resources around hydrothermal vents. First, we have a new vent that's forming at diverging plates. Uh, the, the archaea will come in. The, the microbial communities will first come in. Then smaller, typically crustaceans, will come in their wake, and they will graze upon, they'll feed upon these, these microbial mats or, or fuzzy mats. Once those guys get relatively abundant and we have some of these small, other small plankton things becoming more abundant, then we'll get the grazers and the filter feeders coming along that are going to be feeding upon those crustaceans. So things like limpets, things like mussels. Uh, next, we'll get the scavengers, the things that are going to feed upon those attached, typically attached uh, filter feeders. So things like crabs uh, and... Uh, and, and, and fish and things. Then we'll get more of the active predators, things like octopus and, uh, and the like, and some sharks and stuff sometimes. What happens to the community that was there before? Or is, is it just not really affected because there wasn't much there before? Okay, good question. So, so what was there before? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. And in the case of the immediate, the immediate crack, it was probably opened up with, with the crack. So there, it was probably just rock. But sure, if we go a few meters away, there could have been some, some more default abyssal, abyssal uh, microbial communities and stuff. And they wouldn't instantly disappear. But those things tend to be slower growing. These, these uh, vent-associated 
archaea and, and the like tend to grow pretty fast. And so I don't know for sure, but I think they tend to outcompete the sort of default microbial communities that are there. Uh, so that's the typical uh, successional order. And we have, uh, we not only have these chemosynthetic bacteria out free living on their own on the surface of the rocks, say, or perhaps in the, in the nearby water column, um, but we also have um, these symbiotic or commensal critters that have uh, these, these microbial guys within their own tissues. So the classic ones would be those worms I showed you with the big, the what look like two big red lips. Um, so those are vestiminiferin worms. And then we have these, um, these giant clams that are that same, same thing. They have these uh, microbes in their um, tissues. And so like I was saying before, the longevity of any one individual event is on the order of many years, well, potentially many years to a few de several decades. And again, here's, here's, here's some of our uh, tube worms there. Uh, here is some ROV footage, uh, and we're seeing these are all crabs. And these crabs, this guy looks like he's, he's falling in. He's actually in the process of swimming across this thing. And here's a case where here we have a crack and the water and, and the, the water is emitting through this crack, but it's not one of those black smokers that make for more dramatic video. But nevertheless, we still have, this is all hot water spewing out here, uh, chemical rich water. And, um, and so that's leading to this white fuzz around this crack. And these guys are basically walking up and grazing on the fuzz. Um, we also have, uh, we typically think of these things as being hot, and those are hydrothermal vents. We also have so-called cold seeps, which are basically the same thing, just without the, the temperature um, uh, stuff going on. I don't know what happened here. It's got weird. Um, uh, again, again, all the same stuff that's going on in the default abyssal uh, plane. Here, same thing going on. Uh, all the same chem uh, location advantages, same chemical uh, ch chemosynthetic bacteria, but in this case, we don't have the added benefit of the warm, well, potential detriment if you got boiled by the water, but, but we don't have the, um, the, the same warm water coming out. So is it the same chemicals coming out? Uh, but, uh, similar, similar. Uh, usually not exactly the same. Uh, and so here's an example of a of a a cold seep or a, yeah. So what's the process of how do those form? Similarly, similarly. So cold water goes in, but no, it's it, it's all it's all it's all. Um, so sometimes these are these are from methane, so they're not necessarily just water, but it's always a mixture of water that comes out. Um, yeah. It still comes from all the way down the core? It's, uh, well, nothing ever actually comes from the core. That was sort of, that's sort of a cartoony mis misrepresentation. As you get closer to the core, it gets warmer. Yeah. So it, come, it still comes from deep, I would say, but not from the core. Yeah. And I don't know that much about methane vents. So, um, so yeah. Okay, another key thing we need to talk about before we finish up talking about the deep sea is this notion of incredibly important thing, uh, uh, um, life generated light or bioluminescence. Um, we have two main systems by which we generate light. Uh, light. We have the classic luciferin luciferase this is what everybody will be seeing in a few weeks at Halloween. So all those glow sticks, that's a luciferin luciferase uh, essentially based system. It's a pro luciferin's a protein, luciferase is an enzyme, and you add that enzyme, a little bit of oxygen, and it, it produces light. We also have uh, systems that are photoprotein based um, that are a little bit different. Uh, should show you 
Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hold off. We'll, we'll talk about bioluminescence a little bit next time. I, I don't have my video ready to show you guys. Um, but bioluminescence is super cool. Before we leave that, though, I should say is that bioluminescence is arguably the most common way life forms communicate on the planet. Possibly you might say chemical communication is, is uh, you know, if we just added up the numbers, more things communicate with chemical communication. But most folks that work on this argue that bioluminescence is the most common method of communication between organisms on the planet. Certainly much more so than sound. Certainly much more so than, than tactile or those other things that we typically think about. Why? Why would it be that bioluminescence is the most common or, or arguably the most common communication form? Susan, what do you think? Cool. Oh, totally, absolutely. But but why why would bioluminescence be the most common? Let's say when you add up all that stuff, the pre the predator thing and the attracting prey, all that stuff. Christine, help her out. Right. So all those things you're talking about, the, the, the prey avoidance or the attraction or the this or that, there's such a massive volume of the ocean. There's such a large place where life can live that even if things are not cham cheek to jowl, that way, that's way more living space than the two dimensional places of the terrestrial planet that we typically think of. So because we have this massive volume and it's mostly dark, bioluminescence is this incredibly important uh, communication tool. So that's why, that's why people argue that it's the most common form of communication uh, on the planet. Cool? All right, a couple more things and then we'll, we'll end it here. So, um, so these are some cool images from uh, a deep sea expedition. Um, these were first circulated in 2005. I first got these in an email. And it was a bit of a, I don't know if I'd say internet hoax, but, but this, was, um, this was right after this big tsunami um, hit. And people said, oh my God, these things got thrown up on the, on the coral reef. They were brought up by these, these you know, deep waves propagating uh, after the subsea earthquake. And so originally, uh, originally no, people weren't sure where these came from. And then after a little bit, some people pointed out that they actually came from this uh, uh, about a decade before uh, Deep Sea Expedition. But I like them because there's some great pictures. And so I, I want to just flip through these to illustrate to you guys some of the things we see in deep water organisms. And increasingly, as we'll learn about when we talk about fisheries, we are depleting our shallow water fisheries. So these are the kind of things that you'll be having for your uh, fish and chips uh, <laughs> in the not too distant future. Okay, so here we go. So um, uh, let's start with this guy here. This is the default uh, size critter. This is the female. This is the male. So this male has latched on, has bitten, bitten onto the female and uh, is, drawing, is essentially drawing sustenance from her, her circulatory system. And he's basically shriveling up and dying. So he is essentially a mobile sperm packet and that's it. Right? So maybe some of you think that would be you know, an, an advantageous situation based on some of your current situations. But, <laughs> but so this is clearly a response, one response, one evolutionary response to the fact that it's very, very hard to find mates. Right? So if you have a very low encounter, uh, probability 
of encountering critters. Yeah, so one way is, well, when you find someone, you, you do there, right? Velcro, don't ever leave, right? So that's, that, that clearly signals to us that at least the encounter probability is different from our typical shallow water experience or terrestrial experience, right? I know of no, well, I should be careful here. I, I don't think I know, I don't think, except for this, this idiot from uh, college, uh, I don't think I know any uh, terrestrial organisms or shallow water organisms that do the same thing, right? So this, this, this essentially, um, um, not, it's not parasitical male, but, but this, this um, senest male could be there for months or years potentially, right? Okay, uh, here are, okay, so we see, so you, let, me, let me change it around. You guys tell me what you see. So, so look at this and, and tell me what you see and let's see if we can uh, talk through some of this stuff. What do you guys see? What, what, what strikes you about these pictures? Let me say it that way. The eyes, what about the eyes? Okay, so, so a relatively large eye maybe, and then it looks like there's something, it doesn't look like a typical eye, maybe there's, little, maybe there's some additional uh, rods and cones and things to be more sensitive to light. Uh-huh, okay, good, what else? The tail of the eel. What about the tail? It's probably longer, if not the same length, as body part. Okay, so in this case, very elongated, uh, uh, Fusiform shape. Okay, cool. What else? Squid's white. Well, yeah, okay, so I should also say these are from a trawl. So this is where you threw down a net, grabbed some stuff, and pulled it up. So sometimes things survive really well. Sometimes things are a little bit beat up. What I'll tell you is this squid is a little, you guys can't tell it, but a little beat up. So he looks white and absolutely is whitish, but he's more, if he was not injured, he would be more, more uniformly pinkish. But, that, but that's a great observation. So things here tend to be one of a few options. We have this guy who's basically black. We have this guy whose default color is basically red. Right, because red is what we would call optically black. Because if you remember, the red light is the first thing that disappears. So unless we, you and I were down there with a, with a dive light that was a white dive light, there, there aren't really, there are, there's one little exception, but, but generally there, there aren't, isn't any red light down there. So because red light disappears the quickest, recall, now when we see this red, what are we seeing? We're seeing white light coming like this and then and all the white light hits here and only the red wavelength is being reflected then it hits our eyeball and our on our 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 light sensing cell picks up the red thing oh my god it's red right so in other words this 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 coloration is is absorbing the greens it's absorbing the the blues and all this and that. So it's only allowing the, the red to bounce off, and right? But if you don't have much red, that's, that's basically like not reflecting anything, right? It's kind of like a stealth plane. So then why, I guess this is kind of a trick question, but why would it just be black? Ooh, good question. So we'll see that, we'll see a lot of these things will be red. Probably, well one, it's red. So, that, so it, it, it disappears really, really quickly if there's any white. So, the, so that, that helps. But then two, a lot of these things tend to be carotenoid pigment based. And so those are a, a common, a common um, pigment generated by crustaceans. So, 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 these, so, these, so these are a relatively, uh, relatively available biological or family of compounds, I would say. So, so I don't know for sure. But that, I think, is the most likely explanation, is that one, it's red, so it, there's an advantageous thing to being red as opposed to green or yellow or whatever. And we have a lot of compounds that make redness relatively easily. Okay, how about that, dude? I know, pretty cool. What did you say? 
It is a great Halloween costume. I was trying to figure out what I was going to be. I wanted to be a squid, but I was having a hard, I'm having a hard time finding a squid costume. So I might have to go with something else. But, but um, ooh, that reminds me. Before I forget, I'll have to announce this. We have our annual coastal Halloween contest in this class. I've not, I've not announced this. I know we were several weeks out still, but uh, I'll, I'll have to, I'll re-announce it. But so every, oh wait, what, what, Halloween's what, Friday this year? Saturday. Saturday. Okay. So it's going to be the Wednesday before, I'll have to look it up, but it'll be the Wednesday before, but we have our, our annual, now this is not mandated, so you don't have to do this. So you could be totally lame and not wear a costume if you're too cool for school. But um, we have a costume contest. And so um, what you get is you get, um, uh, I usually make it five points on the midterm. So five free points up. Whoever has the best costume. So the theme of your Halloween costume is anything related to coastal or marine management. It could be a critter. It could be a management activity. Could be a person that does a management activity. It's whatever, and so uh, I'm just saying you, you should, as you're planning your Halloween. I know we have several weeks to go. So as you're thinking of what your, you know, your uh, your Halloween costume might be, um, we do have our uh, our class. I'll, I'll describe it as a classic coastal Halloween contest. Anyway, getting back to this. Okay, what do you guys see? The little silvery thing. The little silvery thing. What do you mean? This this dude here? So this is a fishing lure. And this thing right here is, a, is essentially a big giant strobe light. So this guy will hang this out and twiggle this and make it look like, I don't know, a crab or a shrimp. And then he'll chook, chook. He'll make this thing flash with the intent of luring in a little, uh, something that thinks this is food. And then, ah, and look at these fish, ah. So check it out. Clearly an indication that um, uh, there's not a lot of food around because this guy can't even close his mouth with his teeth ever. I mean, check it out. There's, there isn't, there's not a hole in the top of his head that is this long where that, that, that tooth could go into. So this guy's default condition is to have his mouth hinged open. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> And he's waiting the whole time. And it's like, twiggle, 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 this thing, twiggle, twiggle, this guy's, twiggle, twiggle, twiggle out in front of you. Hey, fancy, 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 right? Hey, fancy, fancy, fancy. And then boom, it eats, crunches. So that's an indication that there's a low, a low probability of encounter of prey, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't want to spend your life with your mouth open like that. Also, let's have a look at this. So those are obviously the most, those are the most uh, conspicuous things, right? Totally. But then we also have this guy right here. This is also, this is a bioluminescent organ. organ. That's essentially, when he turns it on, it's going to be a flashlight. It's going to be a flashlight. And in some of these species, I don't remember if this one is the, if, it, if this guy does or not. Some of these actually, most bioluminescence is blue or blue-green is the default, is the default uh, bioluminescent color. In the, in the ocean. Some of these fish, and I believe this guy is one of them, but I could be wrong, um, have actually figured out how to make red bioluminescence. Super cool. And so most of these critters down, okay, uh, so other part, before I talk about that other thing, let's just look. Big eye, right? So com compared to the rest of the ball body, comparatively large eye. So relatively good at concentrating diffuse light, little specks of light, little, little low light, right? So much more sensitive to, to things. And uh, in this case, uh, this guy, I believe, has the ability to generate red bioluminescence. So if all of these, uh, if the default condition is blue-green, a lot of these critters will be, their optical sensors will be tuned to blue blue green light many things can't even see stuff in the red because there's never white light down there so evolu i mean maybe you and i go down because we're stupid and we turn a flashlight on but that's weird right evolutionarily there's no white light down there so why would you why would you have these these you know uh eye spots that pick up red 
length. Right, right. So, 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 you, so typically red is invisible. So this guy, though, has red light. So he turns on this red light, and he can see stuff that other people can't. So he's both got this, hey, come here, baby, come here, baby, come here, baby. He's got this giant trap, and he's got what amounts to, if you will, a, a sniper, you know, a night vision scope that he can see things that his prey cannot. So we have fish like that. Here's a lobster, no eyes, so, so blind. Again, what's his color? Red. Red. So, so carotenoids are classic. So shrimp, right? Or shrimp tend to be red. Crawfish are red. Lobsters are red. Crabs oftentimes are red. So that crustacean, that carotenoid pigment is red. And so, so there you go. So we have, um, uh, check this guy out. This is not the typical kind of lobster that we have. Our lobsters tend to have robust claws, generally speaking. This guy is more of a like pick through and pick out things and bring things to his mouth type of type of guy. A blobfish. Bloop. Okay, so this is another guy that's been wounded by the the act of of towing the uh, the net through the water, right? So his skin is a little blah. But check him out. Blub. So in this like well reddish. So when we have that reddish stuff, but. Also, check him out in the shallow water. He, bleh, 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 right? So clearly a critter that is um, uh, not really probably made to be around edges very much, right? This is a three-dimensional critter. So more of a sort of massive type, type guy. He looks like an angry Thomas the Tank Engine train? He does. Oh, yeah, I don't know, whatever Ringo Starr would say. Oh, so did Thomas. He expand when they brought him up? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, probably. But the, also this guy is just, being is just in a little bit of water and he's, and he's squeezing you, right? If we had a tuna in here, the tuna wouldn't flop, flop down like this, right? The tuna would be rigid. The tuna's got a lot of strong muscles, a lot of, a lot of stiff architecture because they're swimming a lot. This guy is more of like a bleh almost like a couch potato kind of thing because he's because he's he's mostly just floating right he's not 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 a massively uh, swift swimmer okay we have things like this uh this is a um mollusk and typically we think of things with shells as being heavy obviously right so we don't typically think of things with shells as being in the water we think of those things as being on the bottom or attached to the bottom. In this case, this guy has uh, grows what amounts to floats. And so we have these floats around here, and so this guy is, is more neutrally buoyant, and so this guy can float. So even though he has a, a calcium carbonate shell, uh, is, not, um, is not necessarily attached or, 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 or fixed to the bottom. Here's a chimera. Uh, what do you guys know about this guy? Yeah, right. Good. The big giant eye. So again, relatively good at at pulling in diffuse, uh, uh, you know, little bit of photon here, a little bit of photon there type of light. Here is a young of uh, that same genus. I don't know if it's the same species, but but um, why does that dude have? Why does the adult? have no long proboscis and this guy does we don't know we don't know probably or maybe associated with some kind of foraging and digging possibly but but we don't a lot of the stuff we we barely have described let alone know anything about its ecology or how it routinely uh, goes about making a living a lot of these things look like aliens right so a lot of the time when when you know Hollywood folks are figuring out the newest crazy alien, they look at the deep sea. They look at the deep sea. So when they make the, when they made uh, the what's it alien the the, uh, the the you know thing that goes on the guy's face, right? So that's all pieced together from crabs and 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 that that lifestyle is based on these. 
inspired by these Antarctic parasites and stuff. So anyway, um, so a lot of this stuff seems like, you know, Star Wars or Star Trek kind of stuff. Um, again, another one of the, in this, in this case, this is a guy that's benthic associated. Again, we have the red, the, 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 the commonness of the red coloration, commonness of the relatively large eye. Another thing that we haven't talked that much about, but just to emphasize here, the relatively large mouth, right? So the relatively, what we, we'd, we'd say is a relatively large gape limit, or how big a pita could tough in your mouth, right? So uh, as we saw earlier, if you're not going to encounter things very often, one apparently fairly common approach is to be able to eat whatever the heck you can. And so if it's a little thing, you can eat the little thing. But if it's a bigger thing, man, maybe you're not going to see something for another few weeks or, or whatever. So you better, like, eat it if you can. So, uh, uh, I don't know what species it is. Some type of sp a spider crab. So, again, the redness. Uh, these tend to be viewed as uh, defensive spikes or defensive uh, outgrowths of the shell. But... Um, I just saw a story this weekend suggesting that with warmer water, we're gonna with with, with warming oceans, we're gonna tend to see these guys, which tend to be most common in, in polar regions, moving more towards the equator and so to warmer waters and potentially these guys are very active predators, potentially having huge impacts on the diversity of some of our our benthos. We'll see. What's that? <laughs> what what did you say? They got scared, I think. Okay. So another example of one of these guys that can never close his mouth fully, right? The teeth just wouldn't allow it. And again, relatively large eyes, eyes for body size. Huge gape, huge mouth opening, right? Uh, so this guy can, can take, who knows, maybe something half its, si half its body uh, length and, and chomp on it and suck on it and eat it. Okay, uh, firefly squid. So these are these are uh, um, these aren't necessarily deep water critters. They can be, but but um, an example of squids. So these guys are some of the neatest ones. I'll show you some video next time. But these guys are really cool. And uh, so again, these this guy's been a little bit damaged in the net. But squid have a couple or um, cephalopods have a couple different things. Cephalopods. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you some cephalopod stories next time. I love cephalopod stories. Um, I did not study. I studied things other than squid for my PhD, but I, was, I, was very, I could have very easily studied uh, squid and octopus. I, I love these guys. Um, uh, a lot of control. So they don't have a brain like you and I have, but they have incredible um, a control over it instantly control over a lot of their body both uh, uh, all these little spots of color which are under many of them are under muscular control so they can change their color instantly they can change many of them can change their texture to be very very smooth or be look rocky and bumpy especially octopus are really good at that but then these guys also have a uh, uh, bioluminescent organelles all around them and and firefly squids are some of the um the, the most amazing examples of this covered with little glowing spots that again is under their their um control so very active predators uh in much of the ocean squid are can be functionally equivalent to fish very very fast swimmers very very active predators uh, gunnards. So again, we have the red color. Uh, again, the pro proportionally large eye shape compared to the rest of their body. Uh, here's a hatchet fish. Again, the relatively large eye. Now, what do you see about this guy? In addition to the large eye spot. His body shape is yeah. Yeah. So, so he's flat. He is... He's squished from side to side, right? So he's not dorsally, ventrally flat. He's not flattened. T so, so this guy's flattened dorsally, ventrally. So this guy's flattened 
as if we, we, we put him in a, um, a press and squished him from top to bottom. This guy is sort of the same thing, but squished from side to side. Now, these guys are not as deep dwelling as the other critters we've talked about. These guys can come up shallow uh, uh, or, or, or are shallower water critters. So in this case, this guy's got this silvery coloration. So the silvery helps, helps make him look more invisible. So in, in, in twilight waters, where surrounding us is just light blue kind of thing, this, this, this approach is to try to reflect some of that blue, so to try to blend in more with the background by reflecting it. And because he's like kind of smushed like between uh-huh. the foot, he's really hard to see. Like, That's right. Down. That's right. So if we were, and so these guys migrate up and down. Now, if we're migrating down and somebody's trying to eat us, not a problem because it's just black down below, right? So relatively easy. So if we're looking straight down, easy. But if we're, if we're migrating up in the water column or our predator is below us and we had this body shape, if we had the, we can imagine if we had the moon above us, right? If we had the moon above us and I swam in front of the moon, there's a good chance that I would block out the moon. And a critter below me might go, what's that? You know, and look up and start to swim up and investigate. Whereas this guy is going to be more like a sliver, a fingernail through the moon. So much less likely to generate um, uh, investigation if something is looking up from below. So very thin cross-sectional profile. Okay, a lizard fish. So uh, again, this notion of relatively large eye collecting all that diffuse light. And, and look at those teeth, man. Arr, crazy. Arr. This guy also has a huge uh, gape. So, oops, sorry. So this guy's, this guy's um, lower jaw swings out really far again. So we have these very needle-like teeth. So he bites, and he's a good chance of holding on to whatever it is. Uh, here's a dory. Uh, again, big, big, uh, big eye. And we have this flattened side to side. So relatively low profile, say if we're looking at from the bottom, silvery, uh, silvery uh, uh, skin. Uh, crazy shark. Don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about this shark, but he's got these funky bumps. Like what the hell is up with that? I don't know. I don't know. V- uh, uh, not well understood why this guy has this uh, dorsal, why his back is the way it is. What's that? So it looks like they're supposed to be cooler. <laughs> like it was, was partly Xeroxed, and then the Xerox machine sort of broke. That's right. Okay, these things are called pycnogonids, which is spelled P-Y-C, pycno, pycnogonids. Um, these are commonly called sea spiders. One thing we tend to see in these... So now our typical pycnogonids are maybe... Uh, let's say a third, a third the size of your pinky nail or smaller. A lot of times they're a lot smaller. Typical what we find in our temperate zones. Once you go to the polar regions and or go down deep, we have this phenomenon of gigantism, which tends to be the things that we have here tend to be bigger there. And so uh, this guy is a huge sea spider. So instead of being, you know, the size of your pencil lead tip, you know, or an eraser tip on your pencil, it's, it, they can be quite large. And so in Antarctica, I used to get them that they're the size of my hand. And some of these deep, deep water guys can be even, even bigger. And these are little crustaceans. These are little, little uh, crustaceans that go around and graze. Uh, Shovel nose lobster. Again, this guy is going to, uh, we have this, this pinkish, reddish coloration. This guy is going to spend a lot of his time in the sediments. So on the benthos, sort of plowing around, looking for prey. Stargazer, another one of these sort of blob-like fish. This is going to be a classic uh, sit-and-wait predator. So again, not this really rigid that we would see if we had a tuna on the, on the deck of the ship here, but he's kind of, kind of squishy, kind of more passive, more, more, more couch potato-y kind of thing. Big eyes, big mouth. And this guy, as with some of these other ones, is going to be a sit-and-wait predator. So he's going to be sitting around like my opa, 
waiting for something to swim in. When something comes by, bam, he, he slams the trap shut and, and eats whatever it is. Uh, again, some more crustaceans. We have the red coloration. Uh, swimming crabs. So we, you'll see this when I show you some of the videos, or maybe you saw this in some of the videos of the hydrothermal vents. So some of these guys um, uh, have the, their, their uh, rearmost appendages, their legs, have, a, have um, adapted. So I, whereas these legs are mostly for crawling around, these are like little uh, propellers in the back. I'm like, brrr, beating, beating, beating. And so this guy can brrr, kind of swim through the water column. So not for, maybe not for miles and miles, but for short stints, short bursts. So, uh, and again, of course, the red coloration. Um, this is a, uh, a sole. Uh, perhaps one of the most classic examples of these giant gape. Uh, is giant, so check this guy out. So this guy's mouth hinges. Check him out. Let's draw a picture all the way. Oh shit, sugar cane. All the way about to like there, right? Huge, huge. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, able to eat things much, much larger than it is. And so, also, and so one of the things might be with these, we don't know for sure, but one of the things seems to be implied, you guys noted earlier about some of these very, very eel-like, very elongated um, uh, uh, body shapes. A little bit easier sometimes to, well, possibly. The, the, don't know if this is true or not, but one possible interpretation is relatively easy to a little bit of, little bit of sigmoidal wave going through your body so you might be able to more efficiently swim through the water column and and that type of moving like if you take your hand and, and sort of curl your hand right curl your hand left and do that little bit of snake with your hand that's going to tend to produce on average less water disturbance than if i had two wings on the side of my cheeks here and i was beating 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 typical fish fins right so this might be a way to this, rel this relatively common um, body form of elongated is probably a way to move through the water column with creating less disturbance, less signals that you're there to you, the things that might want to look for you. Viperfish, big eye, big teeth again, can't close his mouth. And there we go. Okay, so there you go. So there's a little bit about some of the deep sea. Um, so we'll talk more about this next time. But as we start to talk, when we start to get into talking about some of our deep sea resources, now you guys have a better feel. So generally speaking, low biomass per unit area. Generally speaking, cold. Generally speaking, not generally speaking, always massive pressure. Generally speaking, dark. So in these areas, we're going to have bioluminescence dominating communication. We're going to tend to have things uh, dominant... Um, uh, a way of getting food are these scavengers, are these these sort of more predatory lifestyles, utilizing substances that are raining down, generally speaking, from on high, with the exception of these diversity islands around these vent communities that tend to be concentrations of macroscopic critters and, and all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so there you go. So there's our deep sea. I will see you guys on Wednesday.